Hey everyone, what's going on? Mr. Harvey here. Let's continue our lecture on Chapter 4, The Religious Wars. And today we are talking about the Thirty Years' War. Um, arguably the most important religious war during this time. Uh, arguably the most destructive religious war during this time. Really important. Let's get into it. So, ladies and gentlemen, our battleground that we're going to be talking about is the HRE. And the Thirty Years' War is... 30 years. We're in the 17th century, and the 30 Years' War is happening from 1618 to 1648. We need to know this date. We need to know this war. This war is super important, ladies and gentlemen. Really important for us. Uh, it was a DBQ uh, a couple years back. Um, we'll definitely show up on the AP exam, as this uh, war has major, major, major implications uh, in Europe. Okay, so uh, we're going to be focusing, ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, on the HRE. This is really uh, uh, our battleground, the Germanic lands, okay? Here we go. Um, so let's talk about some characteristics of the Thirty Years' War, ladies and gentlemen, okay? The HRE is our battleground. We are in uh, the Germanic lands, um, uh, and at the beginning of this war, ladies and gentlemen, it was religious. There was Catholics versus Protestants. We're going to see some Protestants fighting one another, all right? Um, very much a religious war, um, in, uh, in, 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 in how it was caused in, in some of the early conflicts, okay? However, we are going to see eventually this war um, evolve into a political war. And this is really important for us to understand, ladies and gentlemen, is there are political motivations as well as religious motivations and why this war went down, okay? Um, very important for, uh, for us to know that. And it's also, ladies and gentlemen, um, you know, in some of the other religious conflicts that we've talked about, um, the uh, French Wars of Religion, the Revolt in the Netherlands, England versus Spain, important for you to be cognizant of the political implications, political causes, as well as religious causes to those wars, okay? Really important for us. And in this 30 years war, ladies and gentlemen, there are religious causes, 100%. We're going to see Catholics and Protestants and Protestants versus Protestants, but also there are uh uh, political implications, political causes as well. So let's be aware of that. Okay, really important for us, ladies and gentlemen, arguably, in, in my opinion, the most important part of the 30 Years' War is going to be the treaty. This is a treaty that we 100% need to know, Treaty of Westphalia, um, 1648. And I would like y'all to memorize uh, the date of the 30 Years' War, 1618, 1648, 30 Years, 30 Years' War. Make sure we know that. Okay, let's talk about some of the characteristics. It's the last and arguably the most destructive of the wars of religion. We are going to see uh, Germany just get obliterated. It, it is going to be just a complete mess in uh, the HRE. All right. And the Thirty Years' War, ladies and gentlemen, is going to really echo those wars of religion that we saw earlier, you know, almost a century earlier with, you know, Martin Luther and the Protestants and Charles V. It's really, it's, it really is going to have a lot of the same, you know, a lot of the same feel to it. And it, it, this really represents, the Thirty Years' War really represents uh, a failure of the Peace of Augsburg to, to create peace. Okay, we're going to see uh, uh, the HRE em, uh, em, uh, Emperor Ferdinand II really kind of try to refight that fight that Charles V fought. And they're going to have the same result. It, it's, you know, the, the, there's, uh, you know, Ferdinand is not going to be able to, the HRE is not going to be able to reimpose Catholicism on its lands. Okay. Um, so it's really, it's going to have kind of the same feel to the, those wars of uh, religion that we saw uh, with Charles V and Martin Luther. Okay. Let's talk about some preconditions to the war. Germany, we know this about Germany. Fragmented, divided, feudal. Okay. Uh, roughly 300 political entities, 300 uh, countries, decentralized. And we also know that Germany during this time is religiously divided. You have Catholics, roughly one half Catholic, roughly one half Luther, Lutheran, but there's also Calvinists, other religious minorities in uh, the HRE. There's been a lot of territorial reversals. You had uh, Lutherans gaining the right to um, uh, worship in certain areas. Lutherans are having success in securing rights to worship in Catholic lands, more so than Catholics in uh, Protestant lands. There's a lot of tensions between different religious groups, Catholics versus Protestants, but also tensions between Protestants, okay? You have uh, 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 tension between Lutherans and Calvinists, okay? So there's a lot of tension in the HRE. Also, something that's creating tension amongst all religious communities, 
uh, is science. Science is beginning to rise during this time. And with science, there's uncertainty in the world, fear, and that's only going to create uh, more problems um, in some of the different religious communities. And so there's a lot of division, a lot of tension, uh, and, and we are going to see a war break out. All right. Um, now, an area that it's important for us in a group that's important for us it, are the Calvinists. Okay. Uh, remember, Calvinists were not recognized by the Peace of Augsburg. They are not recognized as an official religion, even though they are a very prominent religious group uh, throughout Europe. Uh, we're going to be talking about them with the Puritans. We talked about the Huguenots in France, the Calvinists in um, the Netherlands. Unrecognized, okay? Um, and we are going to see in the Palatinate, an area in Germany, all right, Calvinism gained recognition. Uh, Calvinism is going to gain recognition in the HRE under Frederick III. Um, he's going to become the ruler of the Palatinate, uh, and, and Calvinism will be the official uh, religion of his domain. And the Lutherans feared Calvinists, and vice versa, because they had some religious differences. They had a disagreement over the Eucharist. Um, but you know, it's important for us to remember. Not, you don't, y'all don't need to memorize everything about this. Let's make sure that we're kind of sticking to the big picture here. But um, remember, you know, uh, like I said before, you know, our different Protestant groups didn't necessarily just because they're Protestant didn't necessarily you know get along, right? If we we can kind of harken back to Zwingli and Luther, Martin Luther, you know, even though they're Protestants and they kind of shared you know a common disagreement about the the the, uh, the uh, Catholic Church. They also disagreed religiously and didn't necessarily, you know, weren't best friends and get along. Okay, so that's important to remember about some of our Calvinist groups and our, our Protestant groups. Okay. Now, uh, during this time, uh, we're also going to see the Catholics uh, very active in the HRE, and this is very much, um, you know, harkens back to the uh, the the Catholic Reformation and Counter Reformation of Catholics, you know, really trying to uh, reassert their their power and project their power. And um, during this time, we have Maximilian of Bavaria uh, and the Catholic League, uh, you know, really trying to counter any Protestant, you know, groups in the HRE. Um, Catholics were very active via the Jesuits in the HRE. Um, Spain, very active in uh, supporting Catholic uh, um, uh, leaders within the HRE. Um, and uh, Maximilian of uh, Bavaria formed this Catholic League to counter any Protestant alliance, okay, and to counter and to make sure that there was, you know, equal footing in case, you know, the Protestants try to gain more and more territory in the HRE. Um, and like I said, religious, there's huge religious tension. You know, the Catholics don't want Protestants to gain supremacy within the HRE and vice versa. Um, the Protestants don't want Catholics to uh, gain, you know, religious and political supremacy within the HRE. So lots of tensions here. Okay, and it's not like we need to memorize all this. I'm just giving lots of detail and kind of some background information into what uh, what's going to go down during the Thirty Years' War and what kind of uh, sparks it off. Okay, now our um, our uh, Thirty Years' War has four phases. Okay, and we need to memorize the four phases. Very important. The first phase that we need to know, ladies and gentlemen, of the Thirty Years' War is the opening phase, 1618, 1625. Let's make sure we get that date down in our notes and in our minds. Okay. It is the Bohemian phase, okay? Um, now, we are going to see Ferdinand II. He's part of the Habsburg family. He is going to uh, eventually become the, the uh, emperor of the HRE. He, it's, he is going to inherit the Bohemian throne, okay? Um, and the Bohemians did not like him, okay? They hated him, all right? And one of the reasons why they did not like him is he refused to tolerate Protestants, okay? He was, you know, absolute in his ideology, and he was absolutely against Protestantism and Protestants. And so, um, you know, he, he, his, his lack of toleration uh, to Protestants is going to make him uh, uh, um, uh, very not well-liked in, um, in Bohemia, okay? And he was also heir to the imperial throne. And so, you know, a lot of Protestants feared him because they feared that he was so intolerant to Protestants that once he becomes, you know, the emperor... Of the HRE that he, he was gonna you know be intolerant to all Protestants across the lands of the HRE and we know now in the HRE there's a, there's a lot of Protestants there okay there's Protestant kingdoms okay um, and this was his goal okay he wanted to kind of he wanted to do what Charles V could not okay and restore Catholicism to the entirety of the HRE to traditional Habsburg lands but he wanted to Make the HRE completely Catholic, okay? 
to, to finish the job that Charles V had kind of failed. And so that was his main goal. And he is going to uh, he's going to start that in Bohemia by revoking the religious freedoms of Bohemian Protestants. And this is going to result in one of the first episodes of violence, very famous, the defenestration of Prague, okay, in May of 1618, where the Protestant nobles in Prague, Bohemia, are going to throw Ferdinand's regents, Catholic regents, out of windows and kill them. And this is where tensions, this is where the violence is going to start, okay, in Bohemia. Now, ladies and gentlemen, when taking notes on this, you don't need to memorize everything. Let's get the basic ideas down, okay? The most important part of the Thirty Years' War, excuse me, is the treaty, is the Treaty of Westphalia. So let's kind of get an understanding of the different phases, take, you know, have a general understanding of each phase, but really we'll, we're going to be focusing on the treaty here, okay? All right, so we have Protestants versus Catholics, Ferdinand, intolerant Protestants, and we are going to see, um, we're going to see fighting break out in Bohemia about that. Okay, and here's a picture of the defenestration of Prague, and you can see uh, the Protestant um, uh, uh, nobles throwing Ferdinand's regents out of windows because they were so upset of him revoking their freedoms and trying to restore Catholicism to the HRE, the defenestration of Prague. All right, so in this Bohemian phase, during this Bohemian phase, Ferdinand II is going to become leader of the HRE, and we're going to see this war quickly escalate not into just a war, a civil war within the HRE, but into an international war. Spain, we know this about Spain, they're going to get involved in this and send troops to Ferdinand and support the Catholics, okay? Um, we're going to see, um, you know, uh, Maximilian and a Lutheran elector join Ferdinand. So wait, hold on, what? We're seeing... Um, uh, a Lutheran elector joined Ferdinand and joined the Catholics? Well, okay, part of the problem was, ladies and gentlemen, is remember Lutherans were very much afraid and uh, suspicious and uh, uh, of Calvinists. And so we're going to see, you know, even Protestants getting involved in this and fighting against other Protestants, all right? Maximilian, um, you know, he wanted um, more power, wh whereas the Lutheran elector wanted land, okay, but also feared um, his rival Protestant groups, the Calvinists, all right? Um, Important for us, ladies and gentlemen, to know that Bohemia is, um, you know, going to uh, depose of uh, Ferdinand and, you know, th they're, they're going to be like, you're not our king anymore. And they're going to name um, uh, Frederick V their king. But the instability, ladies and gentlemen, okay, and, and, and this, this is quickly going to escalate into this major international conflict, okay? Um, so uh, what started out as kind of, a, you know, a conflict between Protestants and Catholics within the HRE is quickly escalating into this bigger and bigger war. All right, uh, and this rebellion in Bohemia is going to quickly in, is going to inspire other other areas, um, you know, to kind of fight back against Ferdinand as well. Okay, so here's kind of like the Bohemian phase. A lot of our fighting is right here in Bohemia, Prague, an important city there. Okay, and this is kind of where um, we are seeing the fighting start, and this is that first phase. Okay, here's Bavaria. All right, so in, some of our important areas. Let's move on. Second phase, ladies and gentlemen, the Danish phase. All right, the Danish phase. Let's kind of go through this Danish phase and understand what goes down. All right, so um, you know, there's a lot of fear, ladies and gentlemen, in the HRE of this re-Catholicization uh, uh, by Ferdinand II, and that was his goal. Okay, and so we are going to see, you know, Lutheran countries get involved not only to support the Lutherans in the HRE, but also political reasons as well to gain with this instability in the HRE to gain some territory and political power. And one such um, nation are, uh, is, uh, is Denmark with the Danes, okay? And King Christian uh, IV, he's gonna, um, he is going to, uh, you know, try to extend Danish influence over some of the uh, 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 coastal towns in northern HRE, um, you know, also try to help the Protestants, and he's trying to seize the opportunity here to gain more and more power. Now, he's gonna be defeated, um, uh, but you know, again, this is quickly escalating into a huge, huge conflict with some major European powers are getting involved. You've already seen Spain get involved. Denmark's going to be getting involved. We're going to see more and more countries get involved as well. Okay. Now Ferdinand is going to try to end all resistance. Um, and he's going to try to, you know, to just destroy, um, uh, the Protestant Northern Holy, uh, Roman empire. And one of his kind of secret weapons that he's going to be using is this mercenary, okay? And his name is Wallenstein. Let's highlight Wallenstein. 
Okay, Wallenstein was ambitious, he was ruthless, and he was a Protestant, okay? And he simply wanted title, and he wanted money from this. But one of the problems was, is Ferdinand could not control Wallenstein. So Wallenstein is just going to go up, destroy the Protestants in a brutal and ruthless fashion, um, and um, and defeat the Protestants. But Ferdinand is not going to be able to really necessarily control him, and that's going to be a big problem between the two of them. Okay, so this Danish phase where we see Denmark, the Danes, get involved. Okay, and the Protestants are losing. Okay, all right. Kind of at the end of this Danish phase, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to see a really important um, uh, document be produced, an edict, a law called the Edict of Restitution. It is going to restore to Catholics all lands lost since 1552, since those uh, wars of Charles V and Martin Luther, all right? And it's going to deprive all Protestants, except Lutherans, of their religious and political rights, okay? So it is taking rights away from numerous Protestant groups, okay? Also going to reaffirm the illegality of Calvinism, okay? So the Protestants are clearly losing in the first couple of phases, Bohemian phase and Danish phase, all right? And this Edict of Restitution, okay? Again, trying to, and starting the process of re-Catholicizing all of the HRE. All right, and this kind of shows uh, uh, parts of the Danish phase. We see Wallenstein, okay, fighting in, um, in uh, Bohemia, fighting up, um, up in the north, okay. Here is Denmark. All right, so we see here's, here's Bavaria, the Palatinate, kind of how the fighting went down during this Danish phase. Let's move on. All right, and there's a picture of Wallenstein, a Protestant fighting, uh, uh, fighting for the, um, the Catholics. All right, next phase is the Swedish phase, and we are going to see France and Sweden now get involved. So Spain is being getting involved, Denmark. Now we're seeing more and more powers get involved. Um, France and Sweden are going to get involved, and both of them are going to be involved for a couple different reasons, okay? One major reason and common reason they shared was they wanted to stop Habsburg power, okay? And Sweden, a Lutheran, is going to lead the charge. Now, there's going to be religious motivations as well for Sweden, um, you know, trying to support the Protestants, okay? But political reasons as well, okay? Trying to take power away from the Habsburgs, trying to take power in this instability of the HRE. And we know why, and we know why uh, France is going to get involved, and we'll kind of remind ourselves of that a little bit later and review that. But France is going to get involved too because hey, Germany's fighting. Let's let's keep the fight going. Let's let's make sure let's make sure there's instability in Germany because we don't want to unite Germany. We know that about them. Netherlands is going to get involved and provide sports to the pro, uh, provide uh, support to the Protestants uh, as well. Okay, uh, and we know why France is going to be providing support for those political reasons. Okay, to keep Germany divided, Habsburgs tied down, make sure there is no united Germany. We know that is a fundamental um, foreign policy objective for the French. Okay, all right. Now, the leader of Sweden during this time, really important for us to know, Gustavus Adolphus II. Um, he's going to invade the HR, uh, HRE, um, and Ferdinand's going to bring back Wallenstein to, to, uh, to deal with Gustavus Adolphus, okay? And we are going to see the, Swede the, uh, the Swedish army be stopped. Um, um, uh, the German princes are going to be in fear of Ferdinand. Um, uh, Wallenstein is going to be very successful. Um, and we're going to see, you know, Ferdinand actually get Wallenstein killed because, you know, Ferdinand II is looking at this situation and saying, like, look, you know, if I... You know, I am defeating the Protestants in, you know, I'm defeating the Protestant countries, but, you know, I, I cannot just wipe out the entirety of all of n the North HRE. I need to try to get these, you know, leaders back on my side. And so one of the ways that he's trying to get the trust of the German princes and hopefully in, in his hopes of re-Catholicizing the North um, is, you know, getting those German princes on his side. And so he's going to have Wallenstein uh, killed. And another reason why is because Wallenstein, he, he couldn't control him. Um, so Wallenstein is going to be assassinated to appease the German princes, okay? Um, and, you know, the, the, we're going to see the Peace of Prague. The German Protestant states are going to reach, you know, a peace settlement with Ferdinand to tr try to stop the fighting. But we're going to see France uh, and the Dutch with continued, uh, continue to support Sweden 
And all three of them are going to refuse to join this agreement. And really, a catalyst within, within this is France. France is like, what? Peace? What? Y'all want to stop the fighting? No, 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 no. No, no, no. And we know that. France wants to keep the fight going. They want the fighting to continue because they want Germany to tear itself apart because that is a goal for them. They do not want Ger we do, they do not want the German princes to get along with the, the, uh, the Holy Roman Empire. No, they don't want any of that because, again, that, that could lead to unification of Germany and a, a potential foreign adversary, powerful foreign adversary in Europe, okay, that could challenge them. And so France is going to, uh, you know, w along with the Dutch, but really France is the catalyst with, with, with this to refuse to uh, join the agreement and to keep the fight going. Okay, so that is the Swedish phase, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, and we can see kind of how the, uh, the Swedish phase went all around. Here is Wallenstein, Gustavus Adolphus, okay, uh, very important for us. Okay, let's move on. All right, and there is a picture of Gustavus Adolphus, very important leader of Sweden who got involved in this. All right, the last phase, ladies and gentlemen, is the Swench, uh, is the, uh, the Swench, the French Swedish phase. Sorry about that, mixed French and Swedish, uh, the international phase. And this was the most destructive uh, phase and um, just, uh, just, the, 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 just the craziest phase, okay? France is going to openly enter the war, you know, again, for political reasons, okay? And we're going to see all of the major uh, countries in Europe participate. And this phase was catastrophic, destructive. We are going to see Germany annihilate, okay? Annihilate it. And it's going to, it's just going to be decimated. Um, uh, this war, actually, the Thirty Years' War, is the second most destructive war in German history next to um, World War II. Um, but there, it is just going to be catastrophic for the citizens of um, for the citizens of the HRE in Germany. Their agricultural, their economy is going to collapse. Agriculture is going to collapse. We're going to see famine result. Um, it is going to be it is going to be awful. And a third of uh, ger the German population is going to be killed. Thirty three percent of Germans will will die in this phase alone. Okay. All right. Cause mass inflation. Terrible. Terrible, terrible phase for the uh, for the HRE. Okay, it's going to cripple the uh, the trade uh, trade routes of Europe. Okay, it is just going to be an all out fist fight in um, in Europe. Okay, and here's a quick uh, picture that illustrates the the percentage of population loss in Germany. Look at the North, ladies and gentlemen. Over fifty percent will die. Thirty to forty one in some areas. Just brutal. Just brutal, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. All right. So let's talk about the Treaty of Westphalia after this uh, this international phase, the um, the Swedish French phase. Okay. And remember, we need to know our phases. Okay. Of the uh, of the Thirty Years' War, please. Re let's remember our four phases. All right. Um, but the Treaty of Westphalia is equally important for us. Okay. So let's go through the major provisions of the Treaty of Westphalia. Okay. Politically, super important. Okay. Each German prince is going to become free of any kind of control by the Holy Roman Emperor. All right, German territory is going to become sovereign and be able to rule themselves. All right, really important for us, ladies and gentlemen. We see the Netherlands become officially independent, officially recognized in Europe. Very, very, very important. Important. The southern part, current day Belgium, will re remain a Spanish possession, but that we now have our United Provinces of the Netherlands. Okay, our erect, uh, our. Uh, uh, recognized, okay. Um, France is going to receive uh, uh, most of this uh, German-speaking province of Alsace. Very important for us, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, Alsace and Lorraine. Um, uh, uh, really important for us because France is going to uh, uh, take that territory, and we're going to see that territory switch sides a couple times uh, in in the fights between Germany and um, and France. Um, Germany is going to uh, take that territory back after the Franco-Prussian War. France is going to take that territory back uh, after uh, World War I. Um, and uh, we're going to see uh, Hitler want to take that territory back in World War II. So this territory of Alsace and Lorraine. Okay, Sweden's going to receive some territory um, on the Baltic and Black Sea coasts okay, in northern Germany. All right, Switzerland is going to be officially independent of the HRE Empire and, uh, and be uh, recognized. Really important, and uh, Sweden is gonna uh, win a voice in the Diet of the uh, 
uh, Holy Roman Empire. We are going to see the rise of Prussia and Brandenburg. They are going to become the most powerful German states, and we're going to be talking more about Brandenburg and the Prussians. They are going to be the main facilitators in a united Germany. Some very important political provisions, ladies and gentlemen. Bavaria becomes an elector state, all right, but we have some really important political provisions for us. Okay, let's talk about some of the religious provisions, ladies and gentlemen, that are really, really, really important. Calvinists are recognized, and they gain the same privileges that the Lutherans had in the Peace of Augsburg, a.k.a. Calvinism is a legal religion. All right, really important for us. We are going to see the uh, uh, Ferdinand's Edict of Restitution be rescinded, okay? And they are going to also reassert the major provision of the Peace of Augsburg. You remember that? Cuius regio e uis religio. So the ruler of each state could determine its, its official religion. Okay? Um, so it, important for us to remember that. Okay? Now it wasn't, it was excluded in the hereditary lands of the Habsburgs, okay? Um, but that, that official provision that we know from the, um, the Peace of Augsburg is going to be reasserted. Okay? So some very important religious provisions that we need to know. All right? Um, France and Spain are going to continue to fight it out, okay, until about 1659. And what we're seeing here, ladies and gentlemen, is the emergence of France as the dominant continental power. HRE has been crippled in these wars. Spain crippled in these wars as well. And we know Spain has been fighting wars all over, England, Netherlands, and in the Thirty Years' War, and they've been taking L after L after L. France is going to emerge as a dominant power, and they're going to reach their zenith of power um, under Napoleon, okay? And then eventually we're going to see the fall of France and the rise of the Germans. All right, here's a picture of the Treaty of Westphalia and, and um, this treaty being signed. Okay, very important for us to remember this Treaty of Westphalia. Okay, and this is kind of where what our map of Europe looks like now. Okay, we have the official Dutch uh, Republic, still the Spanish Netherlands. We see Prussia, okay, Brandenburg. This is gonna. This is this is this is Germany is starting to grow and mature and become a, a, a more powerful country. Okay, very important. This is what our map looks like now. Okay, now no one was really happy about the Treaty of Westphalia. Catholics were not stoked. Protestants felt betrayed. They wanted full equality uh, throughout Europe. Um, uh, the Pope denounced it. Um, but you know it. The really the big reason of why the Treaty of Westphalia went down is that it you know it ended this war that had become intolerable. It ended this fighting that was just destroying uh, Germany and destroying Europe. Um, and so, but no 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 side was truly ha uh, happy in in the Treaty of Westphalia being signed. But it did stop um, the religious wars. Okay, um, and uh, you know over the next few centuries, this war. Um, and the treaty is going to be blamed for a lot of the things that go wrong in Central Europe. And we are definitely going to see a lot of instability and a lot of chaos in Central Europe after um, the Treaty of Westphalia and during the late 1600s and 1700s. Okay. All right, let's talk about the results of the Thirty Years' War, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. Um, really important for us that Germany is devastated. Germany is not unified. Check that for the French. They are stoked. Okay. Um, ended our wars of religion, really, really important. We are seeing, ladies and gentlemen, the rise of the Dutch. We're going to see the Dutch. They've, they're free now from Spain, really important, really powerful. Um, th this is going to be the beginning of France's ascension to a dominant position of power within the European continent. They are going to be the dominant power, all right? And we're going to see them kind of reach the apex of that power with Napoleon, all right? And we have seen the weakening of the Habsburg family, Spain taking a huge loss, and we've covered that, but also in the HRE as well. The HRE just got torn apart, okay, and annihilated in the Thirty Years' War. So the Habsburg family has lost lots of power, and we're going to see the Habsburg family uh, continue to lose power as we go throughout history, okay? All right, that is it for Chapter 4, ladies and gentlemen. Excellent job. Thank you so much. Um, uh, we're going to start the next lecture uh, on chapter five, and we're going uh, to be talking about absolutism, English Civil War, and a lot of other topics. All right. Thank you so much. Take care.